since 1996, so 18 years. I say that I've been studying the effects of audible sound on the human body and its biofilm. I'm a writer. Obviously, I wrote a book. I also write articles. Um, I'm an educator. I teach this method that I've developed that I call sound balancing. I also have the good fortune to teach in a public college. I teach a course on sound healing in a public state college, if you can believe that. I live in a small town in Vermont called Johnson, and there is a state college there called Johnson State College, where they have the first undergraduate degree program in wellness and alternative medicine. And they've been doing that for about eight or nine years. Yay, Vermont, right? We're always ahead of the curve in Vermont. Um, so I teach a, just a one credit class, but it's a lot of fun to teach in a college. Um, I have a, I received my undergraduate degree in wellness and alternative medicine at Johnson State College. I have a master's in education. I call it integrative education. And I'm currently working on a PhD, um, technically in integral health, but with a focus on what I call biofield science. I always like to kind of make up my own things. Uh, certainly biofield science exists as an area of study, but it hasn't quite edged itself into academia, and there are very good reasons for that, and I'll talk about some of that, why that is. Um, I, I wrote a master's thesis called Exploring the Effects of Audible Sound on the Body and Its Biofield, and that became the basis for my book. So this method that I call sound balancing that I've developed, and, it, and it's sort of by accident, I didn't sort of intend to develop a method, it just sort of happened that way. Um, there's a list, I don't know if, how well you can read it, um, but over the years, I've used it to treat quite a lot of symptoms uh, successfully. And it's a very, very simple technique. And I've actually whittled it down so that you can do it with just one tuning fork. And, and you don't need really any specific frequency. I, mean, I have a frequency that I use, that I really like. I've tried all different kinds of frequencies. This one particular frequency uh, seems to be the easiest. The, my favorite frequency is 174 hertz, and we all talk about different frequencies that we like, and, and we think that they're special. So this is my special frequency. Um, it is particularly well suited to the sound balancing process. Um, and <clears throat> I also use a 528 hertz fork. It's not because I think 528 is the end all be all. Um, I had to pick two frequencies to sell, and I knew that a lot of people really liked 528, so that was why I chose this one. Um, I don't think, you know, I think ultimately in tuning fork work, what's really important is coherence, that you're using a coherent frequency, and that the specific frequencies don't matter quite so much, especially in this particular method. So whatever forks you've got, you can use for this method. So the way uh, I started off using tuning forks like most people do, I, I was a massage therapist back in 1996, and I started reading uh, some books on the use of color, sound, and music in healing. And this was on the heels of reading like pop quantum physics that said, you know, everything is vibration. So if everything is vibration, then treating vibration with vibration seemed very logical to me. It seemed very elegant and sensible. And as a researcher, when I get interested in a particular topic, I go and I read everything I can find on that topic. And so I went out, this was in the mid-90s, and found everything I could about sound. And then I got a catalog in the mail that had a set of tuning forks for healing in it. And I was like, oh, look, sound healing. So I ordered them, and I started playing with them with my massage clients, just a few, you know, people who were willing to be guinea pigs. And I thought that when I activated a tuning fork and approached the body with it, that it would produce an objective tone, that it would sound the same. It would just be an input. What I didn't expect was that the tone actually changed. As I moved it around the body, it changed in pitch and volume and timbre. And and it seemed to be that that change seemed to be reflective of what was going on in the body. So if somebody had pain in a particular area, the tone would sound really sharp or it would sound really full of static. And I discovered that if I, if I hung out in that area for a little while, that the tone would, would modulate and it would start to sound more clear. And then the people would come back the next week and they'd say, hey, all that pain went away in my shoulder. And they asked me to do it again, you know, use some more sound on me. And so in, in pretty short order, my massage practice morphed 
morphed into a sound practice. And I developed this little um, you know, method of going through. I had the solar harmonic spectrum, and I, you know, you see over the root chakra, D over the second, and it's a little tiny instruction book, you know, said so to use them that way, so that's what I did. So in addition to um, to like, you know, hanging out in areas that were didn't sound right, that were dissonant. I also discovered that there were particular areas where the tone would actually get loud. You know, I'd be passing it over somebody's hip and the volume would go up. And I thought, well, if it's going to sound loud anywhere, it should probably sound loud over the chakra. And I made this very curious discovery that I could actually kind of hook into these loud spots and I could, and I could move them. I could drag them. I called it click, drag, and drop. I still call it click, drag, and drop. It, it's, the, it's very much the same thing. It is sort of, you know, if, you use a, if you've ever used a magnet to move iron filings, right? It kind of hooks in and drags them along. And that was really the sense. So I, so I developed this little protocol of like finding the loud spots and just moving them into the center. You know, just combing from the root to the crown. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, right? And I was getting really neat outcomes. And, you know, so this was something that I did for years. I did it as a hobby. I was in the restaurant business for 20 years, then I owned a specialty food business. I'm from Vermont. I made maple kettle corn for a few years um, and, and really didn't want to be a healer because I'm a very logical person. Um, things need to make sense to me. I'm very grounded and very practical. And when I would tell people that I use tuning forks for healing, you know, you'd get that kind of skeptical response. And, and, and I didn't want to be perceived that way. I didn't want to be perceived as some kind of new age healer. Uh, so I kept it really on the side for years. But I kept seeing more and more and more compelling outcomes. And, and then one day, something happened that completely changed my whole practice. And that was, I was working on a person who was complaining that she had pain and a sense of pulling in her neck and her jaw and down into her shoulder. And she'd been for numerous treatments. She'd tried different therapies. Uh, she'd seen an osteopath, an acupuncturist, massage therapist. Um, nobody had been able to help her. And so I was doing what I usually do, which was kind of checking out the area close to the body. And then something kind of weird happened. There was this very loud noise out my window. And so I walked over to the window, and I looked out the window, and I didn't see anything. And I turned around, and I activated the tuning fork right at the window. And I started walking towards her body with the tuning fork activated. And when I got to be about, oh, it was on this side, I probably about this far away from her body, I suddenly hit a loud spot. And when I passed the tuning fork through it, it got loud. And when it came out, it got quiet. And I was like, wow, I found one of these loud spots that I usually find close to the body, but it's way the heck over here. So what's up with that? So I employed the click, drag, and drop technique. And I was actually able to kind of pull this loud spot all the way back and drop it into her throat chakra. And when, when I put drop things into the chakra, there's this feeling like there's a little vortex there. And it just kind of sucks the energy in, where it seems to sort of redistribute it through the body. That's my sense. So, so she went home, and she called me the next day. And she said, Eileen, all of that pain and pulling is gone, just like that. And I was like, wow, well, that's really interesting. So with the next person that came, I started as far as away as I could in my treatment room. It was about six feet away. And I started moving in towards the body. And I started discovering all kinds of phenomena. I started, I, I kept finding loud spots. I found things that felt like channels, like walls. Like the, there was like this whole sort of structure that, that seemed to be there. And so this sort of click, drag, and drop thing, same thing, only I'd start five or six feet away. And over the course of doing this, I started to discover something that was very surprising to me. And what, what it was, was I kept discovering. Now, I don't know if anybody else has had this experience with tuning forks, but when those tones change, there's information in that. And really, from the beginning, when I started doing the tuning forks, I could somehow translate it or understand it to some degree or another. But when I started working off the body, I started discovering, for example, I kept finding all of the sad tones in this particular area off the left side of the heart chakra. Every time I got in there, it seemed like there was a sad story. And then I just started discovering sort of all the angry stories over here and all the frustrated stories over here. And, and what began to emerge, and, and this took years to emerge, but I, I crea created what I call the um, biofield anatomy map. And basically, I, 
it, it struck me that the human energy field appeared to have an actual anatomical structure to it, that it seemed to hold our memories in a very specific format. And, and I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it for a long time because I'd never come across information like that before. You know, I, I thought if, if there really was some kind of anatomical structure, some kind of like delineated storage system in the biofield, wouldn't somebody have already discovered that? Right? So, so I, I had a hard time um, really, but then I kept seeing it over and over again. And meanwhile, my practice started getting busier and busier because, you know, if anybody has a successful practice, you know, people come to you with problems. And if you help them solve their problems, then they go and tell their friends, right? And so what was happening in this method was I was helping people to solve their problems. I was helping to get rid of pain. I was helping to get rid of anxiety, all kinds of stuff. And so my practice kept getting busier and busier. And, and this, this pattern just showed up like over and over and over again. So in addition to discovering that, that the field seemed to be sort of compartmentalized or stratified, I also discovered that it seemed to be timelined as well. And what I mean by that is that I would find information that seemed to relate to things that were current or recent close to the person's body. I found information that seemed like it related to gestation, birth, and earliest childhood out at the outer edge of the field, which is about five feet on most people. And then everything else fell in between, like rings in a tree, okay? And the way that I was able to determine these ages is um, through what I call working with my mail slot, and I mean M-A-I-L, mail slot, like the little thing that opens. So um, being a, a sort of skeptical, logical, practical person, I'm not comfortable talking about guides or angels or things like that. They make me kind of uncomfortable because we don't really know, you know? Like I like to be able to verify things. So when I get information that comes to me, and I don't know where it comes from, I talk about, and, and this isn't my, uh, somebody else has come up with this, and I can't remember who it was, it was a book I read, but this fellow talked about his intuitive process. It was like having a mail slot in the back of his head, and every once in a while the slot would open and a note would drop in. And he found that if he, you know, if it had instructions, if he followed the instructions, he would get a good outcome, um, things like that. And so I was like, wow, that's really what it feels like to me, you know, when I'm working, I'll just be going along and all of a sudden I'll, I'll hit this particular area and the mail slot will open and a note will drop in and I'll say, you know, sadness, age 12. And, and so I would say to my client, you know, what happened with you when you were 12 that was really sad? And the person would say, oh my, well, that's when my dad died, right? So the mail slot was really accurate and it just kept always dropping in these really accurate notes. And so that was what allowed me to kind of perceive this timeline thing. So, <clears throat> One of the phenomenons in moving in towards the body and hitting these particular areas, like let's say it was the person was 12 and uh, their dad died, there would be a feeling almost as if I was hitting a wall, like hitting resistance, like there was some actual stuff there. And, and the stuff would move, right? That's, those are the loud spots that seem to have stuff in them. It, it also seemed like there would be very chaotic kind of frequencies present. And so the tuning for this is sort of the way that I've come to see it, and I don't know if this is what's really happening, and it's certainly my perception, that the tuning forks modulate whatever frequency is present. So if there is a tremendous amount of stress or chaos or upset, it's gonna be reflected in the overtones of the tuning fork. And when you hold the tuning fork in that particular spot, it modulates that frequency. It gets it to become more coherent in its expression. And through that process, the energy that seems to be stuck there, and, and when I very first started doing this and I'm finding these bits of stuck energy and moving them back to the body, it made me think of, in shamanism, they talk about the concept of soul retrieval. Is anybody familiar with soul retrieval? So, so the idea is when, when a shamanic practitioner engages in a soul retrieval process, they enter into an altered state of consciousness and they use active imagination for a process called journeying to go back in time and find that bit of soul that split off in a traumatic experience. So it's like the part of you that's freaking out and, and doesn't know what to do and doesn't know how to handle it, and, you know, you can't really integrate the experience, so you just kind of leave it behind and you move on. You carry on. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. How come you decided to bring it back to yes. chakras instead of actually kicking it out of the field? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And there, you know what, there are people who actually do that. Um, I believe in recycling. <laughs> well, it, it actually modulates the frequency. It takes it out of chaos. And, and so it's able to settle down. And then the energy that's been sort of stuck there, the, the bit of soul that was lost, if you will, can, can then be liberated and returned back to the body. And when you drop it into the body, the body recycles it. I mean, it's, it's like yourself, you know? So it isn't necessarily anything that's bad that we want to get rid of. It's just something that's sort of stuck in a bad pattern in a non-beneficial or what I call a pathological oscillation. Um, when we return it to the body, people's energy level actually goes up. Yes, I have experimented with that. And, and um, having done both, what feels more appropriate to me, at least for my approach, my work, is to, is to recycle it, is to reintegrate it. Because it's not bad. You know, and it's not anything we need to get rid of. If, if you think of it in terms of soul loss, it's actually something that you want to retrieve. So you're doing it and bringing it back. Bringing it back. Really supporting people in integrating those experiences that they weren't able to integrate at the time. And it's almost like the sound sort of pre-digests it, you know, like a mama bird kind of pre-digests food for the baby, right? The sound kind of breaks it up and makes it, makes it able to be integrated. Plus just the act of, of witnessing, you know, that there's a certain t sort of triangulation that happens between the person on the table, the practitioner, and then the, the sort of objectivity of the tuning fork. And, and simply in that witnessing process and bringing it to light, healing happens. Because you've already had the experience, and now your scattered stress energy, it's like, oh, we don't have to, that gets all relaxed, so you just can look at the experience and go, yeah, I had that. I had that, yeah, and, and I can. It's not a put away, hide it anymore. Right. Yep, exactly. So what, what my big question was when I was, you know, encountering this stuff in the field that I seemed to be moving and that seemed to be being absorbed back into the body was, what is it? And, and what laws of physics are governing the fact that the tuning fork seems to act like a magnet to bring it back into the body? So, you know, it wasn't, we could call it chi, you know, we could call it prana but I was sort of educated into a Western mindset and Western language, and, and those words don't work for me, right? So I started trying to find physicists <laughs> to talk to about it and, and, and try to explain to them, I'm like, this is, this is what's happening, this is this phenomenon, can you look at this with me and help me to try to understand it and explain it? And every physicist I talked to, this was the response I got. They wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't give me the time of day. And, and I didn't understand it at the time, but then as I started to get into my research and um, in academia, a very interesting thing trying to write a master's thesis on the use of audible sound, because in Western medicine they use inaudible sound in medicine, but really not audible sound. We use infrasonic sound to break up kidney stones, lithotripsy, we use ultrasound, you know, diagnostically and therapeutically, it really is audible sound. So to try and write an academic paper about the use of audible sound, single tones, there was a lot about music therapy, but that's really very different. Um, and the human energy field, <laughs> try to find things in an academic database was pretty challenging. I actually succeeded though. Um, but in one of the papers that I read, I came across this sentence that said that the word uh, chi or prana, d does anybody know what that translates into in English? Life force, spirit, actually, or holy spirit, right? So, you know, with the scientific revolution and, and science trying to pull itself away from religion, there was this sort of line that was drawn in the sand. And, and, and the scientists said, you know, we'll deal with the material stuff, and, and you guys can deal with the immaterial stuff, you religion people, right? So when we're talking about subtle energy or chi or prana, that goes into the the domain of, of religion and spirituality. So, so it's kind of unspoken, 
but in science, there's, there, it's like verboten territory. Scientists are really not allowed to go there. It's starting to change. But you know, people in the past have risked their reputations in, in trying to go into and understand and explore uh, subtle energy. My argument was, you know, it has mass. Like when I move this stuff, when I hit it with my tuning forks, there's substance here. It's not immaterial. It, it's it's actually material. And you know, I actually um, recently I worked with a woman who we moved a whole lot of stuff that was stuck in her heart chakra. She had had a lot of sadness and, and been carrying it around for a long time. And in this one session, we really shifted and moved and integrated a lot of it. And I said to her, now when you go walk out the door, you have to be very careful because your body is accustomed to that mass there. Your, your proprioceptors, you know, the part of, of your physiology that is in relationship to gravity is accustomed to that weight. And now it's not there anymore. And she was like, oh, okay. And then she gets up the table and she goes walking down the hallway and immediately runs into the wall on the right side of the hallway. <laughs> because because the, that mass was shifted and it was subtle, but it was enough for her to be not quite accustomed to that redistribution of energy. Yeah. I'm wondering, how do you know where to, up in the body or on the body to drop what you're... Well, I work with the chakra system. And, and I work with the chakra system because that very first set of forks I got said to work with the chakra system. <laughs> and so that's the model that I got into. Not that long ago, I read an article, I don't know if anybody's come across this, I read this article that said that our chakras are constructs so that we can be controlled and that you really should think more about yourself just in terms of your solar plexus or your inner sun, um, which is an interesting uh, place to place your awareness. You know, The idea of the brain as the seat of consciousness has really only been around for a couple hundred years. And um, if you, you know, Google seat of consciousness in history, many cultures believe that our seat of consciousness was actually in our navel or in our solar plexus. Uh, certainly through doing this work, I've developed a lot more respect for the liver than for the brain. <laughs> um, so, so then I've developed another modified technique that actually drops everything into the solar plexus. Um, but, but I work sort of in these linear lines. So, you know, I move in on the plane of a particular chakra and wherever I encounter things. And, and each side of each chakra appears to be a storage system for so particular if memories. If it's here on the side, you'll bring it in here. If it's here, you'll bring exactly. it in Exactly. Yep. Yep. So, so I've, I failed to be able to find any scientists to talk to me, at least in that early stage. And, and I was kind of on my own in, in trying to figure it out. Uh, but then a very interesting turn of events happened that really sort of changed my angle and my approach. And that was that um, when my son turned 12, I gave him some books on science. And he read them, and he came to the dinner table one night, and he said, did you know that there is a fourth state of matter called plasma? And I was like, hmm, solid, liquid, gas. No. <laughs> I said, I missed plasma somehow. I never, I never learned about plasma. Does anybody know about plasma? Yeah, it's in the, in the, practically nobody knows about plasma. It's very interesting. And when we go through the slides and you start to learn about plasma, you're going to be very surprised that you didn't know what it was. So in that same conversation, we were talking about space and whether space was a vacuum. And I had heard, my husband said, yeah, of course space is a vacuum. And I said, no, you know what I heard not that long ago, that space really isn't a vacuum. It's not the empty nothingness that we've all been told it is. I think there's something there. So I went and I sat down and I Googled, space is not a vacuum. And what turned up but plasma. And I was like, hmm, plasma. So I actually ended up falling down the plasma rabbit hole. And I spent the next four or five months reading everything I could find about plasma. I managed to turn it into an independent study for my master's degree. <laughs> and, and everything I learned about plasma completely and utterly changed my life. Okay, so we're gonna talk about plasma for a little bit here. Um, so my, my book is called, before we get to that, i just talk about this slide. My book is called Tuning the Human Biofield. So what is the human biofield? When I first started searching in databases, uh, I was searching the human energy field or the aura and not turning up anything. And then I came across a book 
by a fellow named Gary Schwartz, who's a professor at the University of Arizona, who wrote a book called The Energy Healing Experiments, where he got an NIH grant to study Reiki and other forms of hands-on healing at the University of Arizona. And in that book, I was introduced to the term biofield, which is actually the scientific term. It was chosen, I think, it was coined by Beverly Rubick, who was actually here in, this, uh, in the last talk, and I was hoping she'd be here today, so we could credit her for this useful word that we have. Um, and so it was actually chosen way back in 1994 by, uh, in, through the National Institute of Health. And its description is that it's composed of variable energies, which they call electromagnetic or thermal energies, but also putative energies. And the word putative means rumored to be, um, which may be understood as chi or prana. Okay, so that's the official definition of biofield. Um, it is considered to be metaphysical or pseudoscience because there's no scientific understanding of what the subtle energy part is. Uh, Barbara Brennan, is anybody familiar with Barbara Brennan's work? Okay, Barbara Brennan actually describes the human energy field as a bioplasma. Is anybody familiar with that term? Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> so in order to understand bioplasma, we first have to understand plasma. So it's defined as the fourth state of matter. In physics and chemistry, a plasma is a gas in which a certain portion of the particles are ionized, which means the electrons are separated from the, um, the ions. So it's a free floating electrons and ions. The presence of the, um, this makes the plasma electrically conductive so that it responds strongly to electromagnetic fields. So it's basically a gas that has separated the electrons and it's conducting electricity now. And so that's hydrogen in, in the left, it's hydrogen as a gas, but then once the electrons split off, then it becomes a plasma. These are some examples of plasma, okay? Our sun is a plasma. The solar wind, you know, we're, when, we're, when we hear about the solar wind, we, we, we don't recognize or understand that the solar wind is actually a stream of electrically charged particles that is coming from the sun and it's, you know, and it's hitting our, um, our magnetic bubble, our magnetosphere, which protects us. We, we all know that the, the Earth has this sort of protective magnetic bubble around it, right? And that's plasma too. Um, interstellar and interplanetary space. So play, space really isn't this empty vacuum that we all learned in, in elementary school. It, it actually is, it's filled with plasma and in, in places it's very diffuse. So the, you know, the, there might be only electrons like here and there, right? But they're, they're still there. And in other places it becomes very dense. It gets like, like in stars, that's when it becomes very dense. And when we see things like nebulas, Right? When, when you look at it, this has started to change in the past couple years, but NASA describes these as hot gas, okay? That is technically incorrect. They are plasmas, they are electrified. That is why they're glowing. They're not just hot gas, okay? They're plasmas. Lightning is a plasma. Northern lights is a plasma. And what happens, so we, you know, this is something that's been in the news, if anybody's kind of a space geek like me, uh, you might monitor uh, solar flares. And when we get a, a large coronal mass ejection, it hurls plasma through space. And if it's Earth facing, then what happens, we get uh, northern lights. And that's because there is more electric charge that has hit our upper atmosphere, and it has lit up the plasma that's in our upper atmosphere and taken it from um, dark current mode to glow mode. Okay, so those are the different modes, but we'll go through these first. Um, oftentimes, you know, if you're on Facebook, things like this float around. I plucked this off of Facebook. Um, and, and that is because plasma is actually scalable. So the way plasma behaves in the lab is the same way that it behaves in space. The way that it behaves in your body is the same way it behaves in the earth and the universe. Okay, so ultimately everything, plasma is the first state of matter. It's elementary matter. It's, you know, the, they, they haven't hooked up yet. And, and so plasma condenses into gas, condenses into liquids, condenses into solids. But everything begins as plasma, and the way that plasma informs, the way that it behaves, informs the way physical matter 
forms, right? How you can see how much an eye looks like a nebula. Has anybody ever played with one of these? So these are Tesla balls, right? And you can put your finger on it and, and the charge will go to your finger, right? Because you are conductive, you are a conductor. Other plasmas, neon lights. You know, neon lights have gas in them. And when you flip on the electric charge, it sends it into glow mode. It turns it into a plasma, right? Plasma TVs, everybody knows what a plasma TV is, but we don't really know what that means. I can't explain to you how a plasma TV works. There's also non-thermal or cold plasmas. So plasmas don't have to happen at these very high temperatures. There are certain types of plasma that are actually stable at room temperature. And um, they are being used, this, plasma is actually a, a growth market at the moment. If you're into investing, I would find some kind of industry that's, that's utilizing plasma because they're using them for all kinds of stuff. When I was learning about this, I was teaching my kids, who were probably six and nine at the time, and I, I kept, you know, letting them know they were 12 and nine. And um, and one night I was putting my nine-year-old to bed, and he said to me, "Mom, if I had a wound, would plasma help it to heal faster?" And I said, "I don't know, <laughs> probably not. I, you know, whatever." But then I went and looked it up, and and I found this machine that they are actually using plasma to sterilize wounds and to help speed wound healing. And I said to him, how did you figure that out? And he said, well, I was just thinking about it and it seemed logical. <laughs> okay. So plasma has these different characteristics. It forms filaments, cells, and sheaths. So a filament, and there's one in the background. So like lightning or in the Tesla balls, you know, those, the, the long sparks. Um, Birkeland currents actually are, uh, they're like, strings, like Christmas lights, wires, and they actually travel millions of light years through space and conduct current. And they've actually discovered that um, galaxies form in clusters along these Birkeland currents. So there's actually, uh, they're twisting helical spirals, and, and I'll show you in an, an animation here how they work. They draw together and then they spin, they rotate around each other. So, so there, there are like wires of current that are tr basically feeding electricity throughout space, connecting everything. Uh, they form double layer sheaths at outer boundaries. So um, our Earth's magnetosphere is a double layer sheath that forms the outer boundary of our plasmic bubble, right? The sun has one, it's called the heliosphere. If anybody was following the voyage of uh, Voyager, um, Voyager 1 and 2 were heading out towards the outer edge of the solar system and they were traveling at a particular speed and then they got to what they called the heliopause, which is the, the outer boundary of the heliosphere and they actually slowed down because there's greater density there. There's more electric charge in these outer boundaries. You could almost think of it too, like in the way that um, a fruit forms, like apple, you know, you're like, oh, you gotta eat the skin because that's where the nutrition is, right? Same idea, it's like a double layer membrane with extra charge there and it separates, it is the container of that particular unit. Um, and, and it forms cells of different voltages, temperatures, density, and chemical pro uh, properties, right? So the Earth's magnetosphere is this little bubble with inside the heliosphere, right? The heliosphere is probably within the galaxy and then we're within the universe. So there's all of these different bubbles um, of, of plasma. It has several different operation modes. So dark current mode is when it's the current is extremely low and it doesn't emit light. Normal glow mode is a stronger electric current, so the entire plasma glows, so a neon sign, uh, northern lights, comet tails, the sun's corona. Arc mode is very strong current, and it forms these twisting filaments. We see that in electric welders, lightning, sparks, and the sun's photosphere. So basically, the stronger the current, the brighter the plasma. One of the things that I discovered as I was learning about plasma is a whole different cosmology, a completely different way of looking at the universe. And this is called electric universe theory. And electric universe theory says that electricity, not gravity, is the dominant force in space. And it has a completely different way of, of looking at the universe. So things like black holes and dark energy and dark matter don't exist and have never, theoretically don't exist. They've never been observed. 
They're actually mathematical constructs, and the reason why they've placed these black holes at the center of galaxies is because there is not enough gravity within a galaxy to account for how it hangs together. And so they had to create this sucking thing in the middle and this pushing stuff from the outside in order to account for them staying together, okay? Electric universe theory says this is the way that electricity behaves. And we don't need these mathematical constructs. We just need to observe plasma in the lab and we'll understand this helical motion that plasma does. So there are very different views of the sun. So in the electric sun, it says it's a dynamic electric plasma that's powered by an unlimited universal power source fed by intergalactic Birkeland currents. And that the solar wind is a stream of electricity from the positively charged sun to the negatively charged earth. In our standard model, it, the thermonuclear sun is, is isolated by itself in space in this insignificant little place in the Milky Way. And it is a thermonuclear furnace of hot gas burning itself out, that it's completely disconnected from the rest of the universe, and the solar wind is a hot gas. So it's a very, very different model. And certainly in you know, the last decade and everything that Hubble and other spacecrafts have been bringing back, it has all supported electric universe theory. One of, when I read about Electric Universe, now I've been a seeker for many years. I started reading self-help books when I was 17. I've read hundreds and hundreds of self-help books, science and spirituality. I'm a researcher, I'm a rabid reader. One of the things that I say is that the best self-help book I ever read, actually it was the self-help book to end all self-help books, is, was not a self-help book. It's called The Electric Sky. It was written by a fellow named Donald Scott and it explains the science of electric universe theory. And what it describes is a universe that is connected. We've grown up with a cosmology that tells us that everything is cold, pointless, random, chaotic, separate. We live in a cosmology of separation. And we can say all is one until the cows come home. But as long as we're walking around with this cosmology and this perception that space is full of black holes that suck in light and mysterious dark energy and dark matter and that sound doesn't travel through space. If sound doesn't travel through space, how is it that we have samples of what the sun sounds like and what stars sound like? I went to a Mickey Hart concert not that long ago and he had samples of starlight. And you know what stars sound like? They sound twinkly. <laughs> Sound does, it travels through plasma. They're called alpha and waves. So when I learned all about electric universe theory, I realized that here was a scientific explanation for me on how everything was connected. And instead of the universe being cold and separate, it all of a sudden became warm and fuzzy and filled with plasma. And I fell in love with it. My husband actually said to me one day, he's like, you don't love me. He said, you love plasma. <laughs> And I was like, you're right, I do. It was like a romance. I'm connected to the universe. Well, my kids made me put that in. I don't know if you can see it. It's a lol cat. <laughs> Plasma connects from the smallest particle to the largest galactic formation, a web of electrical circuitry connects and unifies all of nature, organizing galaxies, energizing stars, giving birth to planets, and in our own world, controlling weather and animating biological organisms. There are no isolated islands in an electric universe. And that's uh, Dave Talbot and Wal Thornhill. Wal Thornhill is another individual who's, uh, he wrote a book called The Electric Universe. Very intelligent man putting this theory out there. So if you can see that on the, on the left, that is an, an animation of it, Birkeland currents coming together and going into this rotation or spin, right? So when, when these ma male and female polarities come together, they, they, it's what's called long range attraction and short range repulsion, right? And we, certainly men and women can relate to that idea. Um, but they, they, the short range repulsion stops them from collapsing into each other. And so just the dynamic creates this spiral. And you know, the spiral is the fundamental movement of, of energy through, through the universe. Everything spirals, sound spirals, water spirals, blood spirals through your veins, everything travels in spirals. And that's what plasma does as well. 
So these are just some images of, um, the one on the left is the artistic impression of the magnetic field of a photon. A photon is a carrier of the electromagnetic charge and it's polarized. It, a photon has a north and south pole and consequently it has this little plasmic bubble around it. And then there's the magnetic field of the earth, the magnetosphere, the magnetic field of the sun, the heliosphere. Well, this is where it gets interesting, okay? So this is the metaphysics of plasma. And when we look at um, magnetic fields and, and this idea of having these bubbles around us, it actually corresponds with the idea of the human energy field. That we have, we're electric, we have a north and south pole. So why wouldn't we have this bubble around us as well? Now, the, the kind of conventional wisdom is that that we don't have enough electricity in our body to generate a magnetic field that big. That's what the skeptical scientists will tell you. But there's been a device around since the 70s called a squid magnetometer that has actually detected the magnetic field by some accounts three feet and by other accounts up to 12 feet away from the body. Okay? So, so the idea that there is this sort of diffuse magnetic or diffuse bioplasmic field that surrounds the body has actually been verified by scientific equipment, okay? And certainly, if you think in terms of fractals and the idea that, that shapes repeat throughout nature, it would make sense that if the sun's got this around it and the earth's got this around it, then other living organisms that also have north and south poles would also have this around it. And it behaves very much like plasma. So, um, the way that plasma behaves in the lab really mimics these images that, uh, that we have in the esoteric literature to describe our subtle bodies. When also the chakras, meridians, and nadis. So we've got the filamentary currents. You know, they, there's a saying that you have 72,000 nadis that go through your body, these filamentary currents that, that tra um, transfer subtle energy through the body. Um, the double helix, the idea that we have the Ida and the Pingala that go up and cross as they go through each chakra, right, um, through the Shushuma or the, the neutral um, midline. A plasma focus device creates something that looks remarkably like a chakra, okay? So, and that just talks about uh, so coming back to this particular image of the biofield, that's really the way that I perceive it with my tuning forks. It does definitely seems to be about that size and shape. And, um, but, but where my research has kind of taken it a bit further is saying, well, there actually really does appear to be an actual structure within this. And um, so, so I have I formed a hypothesis, and uh, part of being enrolled in a PhD program is that I'm actually testing this pro this hypothesis. I'm bringing the scientific method to uh, my discoveries to see if there is a way to objectively determine if this structure that I've observed subjectively really does exist around the body. So I believe that the biofield is a diffuse bioplasmic bioplas magnetic medium that stores the record of all of our life experiences. It is compartmentalized with the, different, the record of different emotional experiences being stored in different stratified locations throughout the field. Different emotions have different frequency signatures, okay? So what I've discovered is that, um, that this is the way that I've been able to determine this anatomy is that different emotions sound differently. Sadness really does sound like sadness. You know, th this isn't really rocket science and I don't really have any like special abilities for hearing uh, above and beyond. In fact, I had to take singing lessons for seven years before I could finally sing on key. So, so I'm not, uh, you know, I don't have superhuman capacities. When I teach this to students, people can hear it and feel it. In a room of, of 10 people, if we're passing the tuning fork through an, an area of sadness, it's totally evident to everybody. You can hear it. And, and in the same way that, you know, when you hear certain types of music, it evokes a kind of emotional response in you, right? We, we've gotten so caught up in words that, that we've kind of lost the underlying frequency of things, so we would just always want to put words on things, but really everything is really sort of a feeling, right? And that's a, a frequency pattern. So different emotions have, are, um, have different frequency signatures, like fear has a very distinct signature. It actually has a kind of kind of quality to it. Um, anxiety is similar, but a little bit different. Um, excitement is similar, but a little bit different. Um, and, and actually, I, I've discovered that animals have the same 
pattern, but not only animals, because we would kind of think that, right? I mean, you know your dog knows how you're feeling, or horses are definitely really attuned to our emotions. But I did an experiment on a plant and found that the plant actually produced fear. This was a very interesting experiment. Um, a plant was hooked up to a, what are those truth machines? Does anybody? Polygraph. It was hooked up to a polygraph machine, and um, there were two, and the first one I worked on was a medicinal plant, and as I approached it, it actually, the little needle went down, and the researcher who was studying him said, oh, the plant is relaxing. And, and it was very interesting, because there's this feeling when I'm working with each chakra, when I'm done, and it's kind of integrated and balanced what we're doing in that layer, there's this sort of release or lightning that happens and I know that I'm complete. And so that happened with the plant. I actually got that sort of release, but then I went back with another strike and the needle started to edge upwards. It was like the plant knew that it was done. And it was like, what are you doing? Coming back, like I thought we were done. It started to tense up. The next plant was an ornamental bamboo plant. And when I approached it, the needle didn't go anywhere. If anything, it started to edge upward. But I heard the frequency signature that I've come to recognize in humans as fear. And I was totally blown away. And what, what verified that was that the researcher said to me that he had had a psychic in there the week before who worked with the uh, Colorado State Police, very, very good psychic, and she had told him that that plant was afraid. So, yeah. So, you know, and it makes sense in a way because we all kind of came out of the same, cosm you know, the same cosmic soup. Everything kind of developed from, from, so we really all do share a common language at this, at this language of vibration. Very interesting to discover that. So it's timeline. The information at the outer edge of the field relates to gestation, birth, and earliest childhood. Information close to the body is current or recent, and everything else falls in between, like rings in a tree. Really, truly very equidistant. So if somebody's 40 and I find something halfway through, then that is when they were 20. And you can't really see this. The, the biofield anatomy is outlined in detail in my book. And I talk about how these different states of mind, and when we energize these different states of mind, if, if we're in an unbalanced place, we start to develop a breakdown in our physiology. So a really classic area is that when we're in busy mind, when, when our mind is going, we're in busy mind that leads to busy body, people energize this particular area of their field. And what that does is it creates problems with people's right hips. Okay? So almost without exception, everybody I've ever worked on who has had a right hip replacement or has right hip issues is over busy. Very, very common American issue. <laughs> um, issues relating to the left shoulder relate to sadness. You know, I've worked on people that have had all of this pain in their left shoulder, nothing wrong with it, and then discovered that they just had huge amounts of stuck energy out here. And then when I shift this energy back into the heart chakra, the pain goes away. So um, I can give a few more examples. I worked with somebody who had Crohn's disease and had a lot of discomfort in this particular part of his body. Second chakra, right side, seems to hold the patterns of uh, guilt. And this person had a habit of doing what I call rewind and review, where he would lie in bed at night and he would think about all the things that he shouldn't have done or shouldn't have said, or you know, and he would beat himself up and feel just guilty for being who he was. He was eating himself up inside and energizing this particular area. Yeah. Have you noticed anything about the left hip? Sure. The left hip seems to it speaks to me of frustration over not doing what we want to be doing. Mine goes off when I'm folding laundry. I'd rather be doing anything than folding laundry. What about the right knee? Right knee relates to obstacles moving forward. I actually uh, just worked on somebody uh, just a few days ago who had um, a very difficult birth experience and a, a difficult gestation and difficult birth and then really for the rest of her life had had a lot of obstacles in her way. And with the tuning force, we can really clean that out. You know how in like a laparoscopic surgery they go in and they clean out joints? Well, you know, this is a way of kind of going into the subconscious mind and cleaning out all that debris and, and integrating it into the body. And she had been very stagnant, very stuck. And, and um, in fact, her, her whole in utero experience had been terrible. Her mother had wanted her, almost got an abortion several times, drank and smoked the whole pregnancy. It was just her whole actually outer membrane, which is this sort of gestational area, was just a muddle from that terrible gestational experience. And so she, her, she was muddled and blocked. And you know, that was my read on her. 
And she's like, yeah, absolutely. And I just got a message from her um, yesterday saying that she had gotten this, 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 and this done. <laughs> that, you know, as soon as we kind of cleaned out those, you know, so, so there's an actual mass to, the, to these structures. And when we go through a lifetime of habits of a particular thing that becomes our story, then we actually become very bound by it. And it's very hard to break out of something like this on our own. But with tuning forks, you can actually go into somebody's field and help clean up the mess. And one of the things that's really neat is that as within, so without. And I know this always happens to me. In 2010, I started having students work on me which was very exciting to actually be able to receive the work. And almost every time I got a session, I would go home and like clean out a closet, clean out junk drawers, tackle piles of paperwork that I hadn't been able to. Because the energy to get those things done had been brought back into my body, integrated, and we'd kind of cleared out obstacles. And all of a sudden, I was functioning at a higher level. Yeah. So generally, I have kind of different methods for the front and back. So let me just um, go through, and I'll talk. A, just I'll answer that question in just a moment. Um, so in, in again, trying to understand like what was going on here, I came across the and this I got this from music therapy, from understanding music therapy because these principles come from music therapy. What David was talking about this morning about how you have to like entrain people and it takes an hour. Um, so areas of historical trauma can be located with the tuning forks because they show up as distortion or noise. The tuning forks will initially resonate with whatever distortion is present. That's how they operate diagnostically. They help us to find these areas. But then because they're producing a coherent output, they begin to entrain the body into a more coherent expression. And the body will relax down out of whatever contortion it's in, you know, whether it's on the, the collagen or the fascia or the muscles, you know, where we're holding that tension and producing a dissonant sound, the body will relax down out of it. And start to produce a more coherent frequency. Yeah. Um, can you explain this idea of coherence? Sure. Um, coherent, the word coherent means in phase. It, um, if something is coherent, it hangs together. Um, it's, it's logical. Um, when, when we're, you know when a person is incoherent, right? They're not making sense. They're kind of all over the place. Whereas if somebody is coherent, you know, you, we all know high functioning people, you know, who get a lot done and they don't seem to waste time and they keep things organized, right? That's a coherent person. If people have had a lot of trauma, they have all these bits of energy sort of stuck out in their field and they're resonating at different frequencies. They may have many different pockets of many different frequencies going on. So when we bring things into coherence, we're bringing them in phase with each other and it creates a certain conservation of energy. Yeah, and coherence. Thanks, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, it's all explained in the book, yeah. Um, so these are the physics principles of resonance and entrainment. So I would also say that they're diagnostic and therapeutic. They're sort of simultaneously diagnostic and therapeutic because the moment you find these areas of static, they immediately go to work to help the body to fix itself. Yeah. Um, so once you relax down out of these areas of holding, um, then blood, lymph, electricity, information, chi, everything just flows better. Right? And another thing that David was talking about this morning, health is flow. Right, so this is just a process of just helping the body to flow. It fixes itself. So there's two basic motions with sound balancing as it's evolved. Um, I actually, uh, over the years, I've used many different sets of tuning forks. I started off with the um, solar harmonic spectrum, which is the C major scale. I then switched to the solfeggio set. But over the years, I've, I've actually experimented with and tried many different sets. I developed my own sacred geometry set when I became interested in sacred geometry. It had 108 in it and other sort of uh, relevant sacred geometry numbers. Um, and, and at one point, I was using maybe 30 different forks in a session. And um, what happened is sort of by, by circumstance, I, I actually didn't intend to do this, but uh, I won't go into it, and it's detailed in my book. Um, I'm down to two, well, three technically. So. This is the 174, it's the lowest frequency in the nine piece solfeggio set. I wanted a second one and I chose the 528, but I could have just as easily chosen the 396 or the 417. I like those as well. And, and I comb, so there's the two basic processes. One is, is combing, which is starting at the outer edge of the field and moving in towards the body slowly, 
until you feel like you hit a sense of resistance, which feels to me like frozen bioplasma where the energy has become stuck in a particular um, pattern. Um, hooking into that and, and bringing it into the body, dropping it into the chakra. So that's combing, okay? And then columning is simply a process of moving away from the body slowly in the chakra. And I'll show you an image of um, what that looks like. Um, there's a sense of kind of creating a laser-like coherence in the chakra all the way out to the edge of the field. And, and that just goes very slowly until you come out to the end. And what this seems to do is, you know, it, it brings in this stuff that was stuck, and then it integrates it and it focuses it. And, it, you know, it, what it's done for me in the, in the years that I've been receiving this from students is it's, it's obviously made me way more coherent. Um, but another thing that David spoke about this morning, I felt like he really spoke to me, is that it's helped me to maintain a state of equanimity. It's really helped to, you know, all of these places, they're like our buttons, you know, these wounds from childhood. You know, I grew up with five older siblings who all picked on me. I had all kinds of wounds, you know, that I needed to heal. And, and damned if my husband didn't plug right into him, you know. <laughs> and it's so easy to blame him and be like, it's you, it's you, you know, you're making me feel this way. Um, but the tinning forks really find those hot button spots and, and they discharge them, they deactivate them. It's sort of like snipping the wire to it. And, and then all of a sudden, the, you know, those things that would like set you off and make you lose it or, you know, become all kerfluffled, you just are neutral about them. You're just, there's no charge there anymore. So you're just not reacting to them. And, and so it's, it's actually, I call it sound balancing, it really is balancing. I feel like it's really deepened my keel and, and made it so that, you know, winds blow, but I'm pretty much staying on keel because I'm not, these spots aren't firing off in me. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So have you done some of that practice where you put your etheric body on the table, you know, with intent to clear, and you start out and yeah. the field of yourself? I'd much rather have a student do it. You, you can. You can. And, and you can conduct this work at a distance uh, on others, too. Yeah, but I'm mostly, I, there's some things I want to do for myself. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to work with practitioners, but there's some really yeah. old stuff. It's like, all right, okay. right. Yeah, you know, when people ask me if you can work on yourself, I say, well, you know, you can give yourself a foot rub, but it's way better to have somebody else do it for you, you know what I mean? But, but you can work on yourself. In fact, I started getting a problem with my, uh, my right knee and my right foot were bothering me the other day, and I just, you know, I just did this, you comb in until you hit the, the static, the noise, the resistance, and then you just go slow, and it was gone. So, um, so you can certainly work on your own aches and pains in ways. Your own emotional stuff is a little harder to do, but, but you you know, try. Play with the tuning forks, like wave them around until you hit static, hang out in it, you know? You can refer to my book in the, the biofield anatomy and you can be like, oh, you know, this area relates to speaking and not being heard, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Well, in my book I outline uh, how I use CDEFGAB, right? Um, but how I've actually whittled it down so that you can do it with just one fork. So I, I don't really care so much about specific frequencies. Use whatever forks you have, you know, and play. I, you know, I, I think that this particular frequency, the 174 hertz, is the best for combing. And, um, and I've actually, uh, I went through a process where I was breaking my forks a lot, where I'm actually the first person in the history of therapeutic tuning forks to break them. Um, and, and what I mean by breaking them is that they develop a buzz in them. It's almost as if the overtones were like strings and one broke and they started buzzing. And that's because in sound balancing, the forks are in distortion a lot because you're basically hunting down distortion and so the forks stay in distortion and it was creating micro cracks in the metal. And um, my manufacturer actually had to develop a special alloy just for me. Um, <laughs> So the, I sell those on my website. They're, they're more expensive than other tuning forks, but they're especially designed for this work. They hold up and they maintain their integrity and clarity a lot longer than, than other forks. And, and this specific manufacturer, because when I was breaking forks, I went and I tried all the different manufacturers out there, and this particular manufacturer and, and this particular frequency just really seemed to be 
the best for this work. Um, but, but by all means, use what you have. I think the lower frequencies are better for combing because uh, you get more feedback. Whereas when you're using a higher frequency like the 528, you don't, you don't get as much information. The reason why I use a, a higher frequency as well, I describe this like, you know, when you, when you comb your hair, uh, you have combs that have the wide tines and the skinny tines, right? And you go through first with the wide tines and then through with the skinny tines. And, and so that's what I do here. You know, I comb through first with the low frequency and then I come back and comb again with the higher frequency and it seems to pick up, you know, different things. Um, like a small broom compared to like a street broom. Um, the, these higher frequencies are pretty too, you know? And, and the, the neat thing about tuning forks is they, they don't just reveal the, the distortion or the mess or the wounds or the pain. They also reveal the grace and the beauty and, and the, um, the spirit of people. You know, and they sound different in different people. And, and I really like revealing, you know, sometimes I go into somebody's heart chakra and it's just so beautiful and, and I know it's beautiful and they know it's beautiful and I say, listen, that's you. Like, listen to how beautiful you sound, you know? Whereas the 174 isn't, it isn't, it's like a workhorse, you know? It isn't pretty and it doesn't reveal pretty tones, but, but I like this aspect as well. Do you use another number besides 174 or 52? Uh, no, I mean, you could and I have, um, but, but this is just what the work has evolved into. I do actually...